Okay, welcome to um, Logic Design, um, and this is uh, the lecture for um, the 7th of um, October. Let's, um, let's shrink this down and we'll uh, talk a little bit about the uh, syllabus. So here we are, um, second, the second part of uh, the Wednesday of week seven. Week seven is sort of hard to believe, right? So on Monday, I worked the test. And then on Friday last week, I did unit eight. So we're still ahead. Uh, well, we're caught up, I think, now. Um, um, all right. So, um, yeah. So we'll do uh, multiplexers, decoders, and ROMs. Uh, and uh, you have homework six that's due next week, uh, so uh, October the 12th. So you've got a little bit of time on that. Uh, continue your work on your group projects, and they're going to be due the week of October 19th. So that's uh, a couple weeks away. All right, um, and I, I'll send out fairly soon. Um, some some guidelines on uh, on on the presentations, but basically uh, the presentations uh, you can either record them and submit them as a recording, or you can do them live on a Zoom a time, and we'll we'll provide some Zoom times, uh, maybe in the evenings or whatever. We'll figure it out. I'll, I'll give I'll provide a variety of Zoom times, and I'll let you sign up for whichever ones you want. It should take you about maybe 10, 12, maybe 15 minutes at the most to, to do the presentation. Okay, um, well with that, let's, uh, we'll put this aside and we'll pick up with uh, unit nine. Um, and let me see, i make this a little bit more like that. Yeah, that's not too bad. Okay. All right, so unit nine. So we're going to talk about multiplexers, three-state buffers, decoders, encoders, read-only memories, and some of the progr programmable logic devices. Uh, programmable logic devices are, are pretty much fading away. CPLDs are still used, and then the bigger than CPLDs, the FPGAs, are definitely uh, used and used extensively and will be used more and more. And we'll also talk about Shannon's uh, expansion or decomposition. Okay. Okay. Um, so multiplexers. So multiplexers are really super useful things. Uh, some of our programmable logic consists of lookup tables and multiplexers, and that's pretty much it. So it's very it's so this is a very important uh, logic block for you to be aware of. Uh, essentially, what a multiplexer does, uh, it comes in and it has some power of two number input lines. It could be a two to one, a four to one, an eight to one, sixteen to one. Maybe a few more than that, but maybe 32 to 1, that's probably about it. Uh, although, obviously, any power of 2 would work. And then you have some number of control lines. For a 2 to 1, you have one control line. For a 4 to 1, you have two control lines. For an 8 to 1, you have three control lines. So it's really, the, it's really uh, 2 to the power of the number of control lines, where n is the number of control lines. Uh, that tells you how many inputs you have. So in, in the case of two input lines, we'll have four inputs and one output f. And this is the characteristic equation for a four to one mux. So we have all the combinations of a and b. a prime b prime, a prime b, a b prime, and a b. And we have the three, the four inputs paired with those, those three AND gates essentially. And what that does is, depending on the setting of a and b, that gates one of these inputs on uh, to the output f. And the others don't have any impact on f unless A and B change. So this is a way to select one of four lines and connect it to F. Now, uh, a digital multiplexer always outputs only a zero or one. So it's not like a switch. It's more of a digital switch where you're always outputting a zero or one. You're never outputting, uh, you know, say a half, for instance. Uh, we do make analog multiplexers and we use those frequently too in our microprocessors for our uh, analog inputs. Uh, we often have one analog module and we can multiplex a number of uh, input lines into that one module one at a time. So we can have, say, an A to D converter where we convert an analog value to a digital value. And we can have maybe uh, on the microchip 
uh, product we use in, in Micro One, we have 12 different inputs, but they all feed into the same A to D converter. So you have an analog multiplexer on that front end that picks which input's gonna get converted. And those analog multiplexers uh, pass through an actual voltage value. It, it is very much exactly like a switch. But a digital multiplexer doesn't do that. It doesn't pass whatever the value of uh, the, the voltage is on I0. If I0 is a logic zero, then F will be a logic zero. If I0 is a logic one, F will be a logic one. And if I0 happens to be somewhere in between, it's gonna, it's gonna convert it to one or the other, and F will either be a logic zero or a logic one. It will never be halfway in between, or at least if it is, then the part's broken. There's a problem. Um, and we try and avoid that. Okay, so it's a digital multiplexer, digital in, digital out, digital control lines. Um, so a generalized multiplexer is a two to the N to one, where you have two to the N inputs and N control lines and one output F. So here's a four to one MUX. And you can see we have four AND gates and one output OR gate. So it's very much a, a SOP type thing. Now it could be, obviously it could be implemented with ORs and ANDs and it could be implemented with a NAND NAND and NOR NOR and other, some other combinations too. Uh, but this would be the prototypic way to do it. And here you have uh, the characteristic equations for a two to one, a four to one, and an eight to one. And then the general form. Now, one of the interesting features that kind of illustrates the power of a multiplexer is that any uh, four to one MUX can implement any three variable truth table directly. Now, how do we do that? And you, you definitely need to know this. This is, this, is, uh, this is important. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna draw this out because I want you to get this. So we'll pop this open. We'll switch the camera over here. And then let me just draw this out. Okay, so, so let's say we're gonna implement, uh, uh, I'll do the one on the slides. So let me put this down for a minute. So on the slides, we have, uh, we have this truth table right here. So I'm gonna copy that truth table. So let me do that, okay? So we have uh, A, B, C, and an output F. And so we have, so one, two, three, four zeros for A, and one, two, three, four ones. So we're gonna have eight rows in our truth table, and we're always gonna divide these into groups of two for this particular application. So zero, zero, one, one. And then we have C, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and zero, one. Now, our F, in this particular case, where did we get F? Because this is what it was, was on the slide. One, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. Well, remember, this is given to us. Or it comes from God. All right, so here's our multiplexer. Now we're gonna have four inputs. I0, I1, I2, and I3. Now, we're gonna have two control lines and we'll call these A and B. These A and B will be the same as these A and B. And we'll keep them hierarchically set up. So this is, A is the higher order control line and B is the lower order control line. And then we have one output F. All right, now how do we implement this truth table with this MUX? Well, it's pretty simple. Now that we have them divided up into pairs of two rows each, we notice that for each pair of rows, our A and B are the same. And we notice that we have four paired rows and we have four possible values for A and B, both zero, zero, one, one, zero, and both one. So if you think about it, this, this, these two rows correspond to this MUX selecting I zero. If A equals 
zero and vehicle zero, then we're going to select we're going to select for I zero, and so forth for every pair of rows. This pair would select for I one, this would select for I two, and this would select for I three. Now all we have to do then is look at the 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 fact that there are four possible uh, ways F can be set up within each pair of rows. F can be zero zero, F can be 0, 1, F can be 1, 0, or F can be 1, 1. Those are the four possibilities. And it turns out if they're both 0, then we just need to feed the constant 0 in to get the correct value for F out on I0. And if they're both 1, we just need to put in the constant 1. But what if they're 0, 1, or 1, 0? Well, if they're 0, 1, that's exactly what C is. So we'll just put C in. But what if they're 1, 0? Well, that's exactly C prime. So we'll just put in C prime. So our four possibilities then are 0, C, C prime, and 1. And all we have to do is to pick the right one of these. Well, if we have the rows divided up, now all we have to do is look at F. In this case, F is 1 here and 0 here. That's a C. Here it's 1 and 0, so that's another C. Here it's 0 for both rows, so that's the constant 0. And here it's 1 for both rows. Now, we didn't have an example where it was 0 and 1, but if it had we'd had that, it would have been C prime. And that's it. That's all you have to do to solve that problem. Pretty simple, right? All right. I should have plunged that. So very simple. So all you have to do is divide it up into pairs of rows. Recognize that each pair corresponds to one of the inputs, and then look and see what F has to be or what the input has to be to get the desired value for f. If it if it change if it's zero for both, then you put in zero. If it's one for both, you put in one. And if it's one zero, then you put in c. And here we'll change this to zero one. And now we'll just say that's c prime. Okay. Hopefully, no questions about that. All right. So that's pretty straightforward. What do you do with a eight to one mux? Well, it's exactly the same thing. We we have instead of four rows, eight rows, we have 16 rows. We divide them up into pairs. And each row corresponds to the same A, B, C. And then we just have to decide whether we're putting in a constant 0 for F, a, a, a D, a D prime, or a constant 1. Because our variables are A, B, C, D. An 8 to 1 mux is going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 inputs, 1, 2, 3 control lines, A, B, C, and an output F. And so we just look at the pairs of rows, and we're going to either put in a 0, a 1, a D, or a D prime. Those are the only possibilities. So that's very straightforward. All right. Let's um, switch this back. And we'll shrink it down and we'll switch the camera back to me. Okay. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, the book gives you this business of, uh, of circling, of putting these, these groupings on the truth table. And this is I1, that's I2. Don't do it. It's very confusing. I don't think it's helpful. So I think it's much more helpful to do uh, just to write out the truth table, divide it up into, into pairs of rows, two rows each, and then figure out if you have to assign one, zero, the, the, the last, the low order variable, which in this case of an eight to one would be D. In the case of a four to one, it would be C. In the case of a two to one would be B, right? If we do A, B, C, D. And, uh, and, uh, and so you're either 1, 0, D, or D prime. That's it. And you have your other high order variables are your control lines. In this case, an 8 to 1 mux has three control lines. So that's ABC. And then you have to select the proper input for each of your eight control lines. OK, now, we need, now we're going to talk about uh, three state buffers. And I want to move this just a little bit so you can see that last buffer. All right, so these three state buffers are very important. They're used extensively. Um, and the difference between a, uh, a three-state buffer 
are sometimes called a tri-state buffer and a regular buffer. A regular buffer, there's no control line B. You just have an input A and an output C. In the case of a non-inverting buffer, C always equals A. But in the case of a tri-state buffer with a control line B, you if B is, is active, then C will equal A. But if B is inactive, it effectively disconnects C from A. And so then the output C, we call it high Z or high impedance state, which means basically it, that there's no connection here. It's like unplugging something. And then these buffers come in, the, come in four flavors, inverting, uh, non-inverting and inverting, where here you have a bubble on the output, and for these two you don't. And then the, the control line can be active high, like it is here and here, or it can be active low, where there's a bubble on it, as in here and here. If the control line is active low, when B is zero, then the buffer is working. When B is one, the buffer is turned off and in a high Z state. And so here are the four truth tables that correspond to these four flavors of the tri-state buffer. Inverting and non-inverting. So if you put it in a one and it's turned on, you'll get out a zero. If you put in a zero, you get out a one. And it, when the control line's inactive, you get out a high Z. We, we don't talk about the control line necessarily being high and low. We just think about it being active or inactive. If the control line is active, then the buffer's on. If the control line is inactive, the control the buffer is in a high Z state or off, disconnected. So if it's active low, that, that means the bubble's there. Then it's active low. Here it's active high. So we talk about the control line being active, and we talk about it either active high or active low. And I think that's the best way to think about it. It'll I think that'll keep you out of the most trouble. All right, what about a decoder? So these were very popular chips when we first started uh, developing computers and the motherboard would have a lot of these chips on it which would be decoding the address lines and we also had discrete sockets where we plugged in the memory chip also on the motherboard not a big long sim socket where you put in a big you know a card with a bunch of uh, computer memory on it but we would have individual memory chips and you would plug them into sockets and sometimes you'd bend the legs and you'd have to pull them out and straighten the legs and try and plug them back in and get the legs uh, into, the, into the socket without breaking any of the legs off. Uh, obviously that wasn't all that much fun. So that's why we went to, the, to the, 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 the memory cards basically. A lot easier to put in and take out. All right, so, uh, so this is a demultiplexer. It has three control lines. In this case, it's a three, because it's a three to eight. And it has eight outputs. Now you also have a chip enable, which basically is your data in. And so depending on these inputs, one of the outputs will be high as long as the chip is enabled. If the chip is disabled, the data in line is low, then they'll all be all the outputs will be zero. But one of the outputs will be basically uh, working and it will reflect the data in line. So this is really a demultiplexer. Uh, if you want to think of it that way, but we normally would use it as a decoder. But you could use it in conjunction. Uh, you could use it in conjunction with a, a multiplexer, and you could have eight inputs over here, and then three control lines connecting both of the both of these parts, the multi, the eight the the uh, eight to one multiplexer and the three to eight line decoder, and you could then the only data line you have to connect is the is the one F output from the multiplexer and the data end to this one. And depending on the settings of the control lines, ABC, any one of the eight lines going into the multiplexer would be connected to one of the eight lines coming out over here. Uh, and that way you could, you could actually time divide eight different uh, phone conversations, say, just by uh, cycling through the, uh, the control lines very quickly and then filtering out the high frequency and putting it all back together on the other end. Um, and in fact, that is, in fact, what's done. It's how we multiply signals frequently. Uh, we may or may not use these chips, but, but a similar type of arrangement it would be used. Okay, the reason why these were used as address decoders is there our address lines. So let's say we have, um, you know, let's say we have uh, 16 address lines. Well, our 16 address lines are going to, are actually going to address uh, 65K 
of memory. Uh, or if we have 32 address lines, we're going to ex we're going to address four gigabytes of memory, and every byte has to have an individual address. And so if you had a 32 uh, line input decoder, you would have four gigabytes of lines coming out. And that's essentially what we do, only we do it all with one big integrated circuit chip. But that's, that's essentially how it works. And on that integrated circuit chip, we have this humongous decoder. And it's probably not just one single decoder. It's probably, uh, it's probably a number of decoders ganged up together. OK, so anyway, so, so we do use these quite frequently for address decoding. Like I said, in the old days, these chips were all over the place on motherboards. But uh, now they're replaced by a single uh, application-specific integrated circuit that does all this for us on, in one big chip. OK. Um, here's the truth table. There are your control lines, ABC. Notice for ABC all zero, Y zero is turned on. Now if the chip enables off, then this will be zero. And that's how the chip enable basically drives this line. But if ABC are one, then this line's always zero, and Y one would be would follow the chips the, the chip select line, and so forth. Um, so our general terminology is an end to end decoder, and it generates all two end min terms. Now you can take a decoder and you can implement, uh, in this case, you, could, you can implement any n variable logic problem with this uh, three to eight decoder, so in any three variable problem. But you do have to add a single external chip. You have to add an OR chip. Uh, uh, sorry, not, not chip. You have to add an external gate. And the external gate you have to add in this case is an OR. You, and, you own, and you just OR together whatever min terms your solution has in it. So for instance, uh, if you had min term 0, 3, 4, and 7, then you would connect those outputs to an OR gate. And when 0 is a 1, the output would be 1. But when Y1 was a 0, the output would be a 0, and so forth. You just add the min terms you need up, and boom, you get your instant solution. But you do have to have an OR gate to do that. Um, all right. Read-only memories, very, very important. These are used extensively. Uh, you probably have a big one in your pocket right now. Uh, that's what your jump drive would be. Uh, your jump drive is just a, is just a big flash read-only memory. And uh, a flash is a type of re read-only memory, but it is, it is just a read-only memory. These are big uh, VLSI and LSI circuits that have a bunch of uh, storage areas on them. And th these storage areas are a little bit different than your normal storage area because these are these are uh, these these are non-volatile. So when you take the power away, they hold the value that you put in them. Uh, and then when you power them back up, you can read the values out that you've programmed in. There are a, a whole host of technologies that have been used for these devices. Uh, in the earliest days, they they were just created uh, at a factory. Uh, by either making connections or not making connections. And then they came up with some that were programmable where you could just put in a little extra voltage and blow a, a, a little fragile diode that would then uh, break a connection. So the diodes that were blown w would become ones or zeros, I forget which, I think ones. And the diodes which weren't blown would be zeros. Or no, it's the other way around. The ones that were blown would be zeros and the diodes that weren't blown would be ones. And, uh, and these were, were what was called one-time programmable. Now, maybe initially they programmed them in the factory, but then later on you could program them uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your shop or in your uh, factory. Uh, and this was really nice because then you could put your own code in the ROM. And ROMs are really nice because they allow you to store uh, uh, a pattern that you want to pull out then at a later date. Um, then we came up with some ROMs that were a, we could a write, we could electrically write them, but then we had to use ultraviolet light to erase them. And the way we exposed them to ultraviolet light was we they had a little window over the chip that you could shine the ultraviolet light through, and you could actually look through that little window and and you could actually see your little your little chip uh, mounted with its bonding wires. Pretty cool. 
and, but then the next step was that we, we learned how to electrically write and electrically erase, so we didn't have to have the window with the ultraviolet light anymore because it was a bit of a hassle to have to pull them out of the circuit and uh, shine the ultraviolet light on the window. And then we'd have to put a little sticker over the window so it wouldn't actually get erased accidentally and then put them back in, the, in, the, in their socket in the device. Uh, now we could, we could do an in-circuit write or erase and rewrite. And then another example of the, so we call those EE proms. And another example of EE prom we named Flash because it's a slightly different uh, approach. And the main difference is that, that the EE prom, you can write and erase and rewrite every single location independently. But in a Flash, you have to write uh, uh, some number of locations. Uh, you have to erase some number of, of locations simultaneously. You can write them individually, but you have to erase a bunch together. Now, how many you have to erase together kind of varies. Sometimes it's only a few. Sometimes it's a, quite, a, quite a lot. Uh, but that allows them to be a lot more uh, dense and compacted, so you can get a lot more storage in the same physical location with, a, uh, with an EE prom, uh, with a flash, than you can an EE prom or any of these others, basically. Okay, so that's kind of the different technologies. Um, here's one where you have a little tr little transistors, and you either manufacture it with these in place, and the other ones not in place, or you blow them by uh, putting in a high voltage and kind of just popping them, making them uh, making them uh, fail. And so these are one-time programmable, or factory programmed, and you can't change them. Uh, the way these work, we address the matrix, and then we get these. We get the, the right word comes out. So there's some number of address lines. If you have n address lines, then there'll be two to the n. Uh, there'll be two to the n rows in your ROM, and then if you have eight output bits, then there'll be eight columns. If you have four output bits, that's your word size is four bits. Then there'll be four columns. If you just have a single bit output, you'll just have one column. So here's an example of a ROM, eight words by four bits with three address lines. So two to the, two to the third is eight, so that's why you have eight words with three address lines. And you have three out, four output columns, so that's a four, four bit word size. And the ROMs come in a whole range of different sizes. Uh, the big ones usually have come in in a uh, in word sizes of a of one byte or maybe even two bytes, but uh, the smaller ones can come in a number of different combinations. Okay, so you can see here. Um, let's say if you if you had a, a four functions you wanted to implement, and they were three variable functions. So you have f0, f1, f2, f3 as a function of ABC. So here's F0, it's got these three terms. Here's F1, it's got these three. F2, it's got these three. And F3, it's got these three. And here they are. Uh, so you you have your ROM, these are, your, this, these are the addresses. So the actual contents of the ROM is just this over here. So if A, B, and C are all zero, it lights up this word and the outputs show zero for F0, zero for F1, one for F2 and zero for F3. If you put in A is one, B is zero, C is one, which would be five, then you get out one, zero, zero, zero in your four outputs, F0, one, two, and three, and so forth. And so basically you can connect F0 to your F0 output, and F1 is your, is your F1 function, and F2 is your F2. So whenever you add another independent variable, it doubles the number of rows, because if you made Say if you had A, B, C, D, instead of eight rows, you'd have 16. But every time you add another function, all it does is add another column. So you can have quite a few output functions, and it, it just increases your ROM a little bit. Uh, but if you increase a, your independent variables, it doubles the size. So, uh, so ROMs can get big pretty fast, and we, we do have big ROMs available. Um, again, this one was eight words by four bits with three address lines. So three independent variables, ABC, four bit it, it bits of output, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows. So the way that these ROMs are constructed, you have this decoder, which gives you your address lines, and 
if you have n address lines, then you have to have two to the n word lines. So in the case of, say, uh, uh, a ROM with, say, uh, well, say 10 bits, then you'd have, you'd have a 1,000 plus, you'd have 1024 address lines, 1K of address lines. And uh, each address line would, would light up one of the rows, and at that row would be stored however many bits your word size was. So if you're, let's say you had 8-bit word size, then you'd have eight output lines, and each address line would, would light up those eight bits for that row, and they would show up on the, on the, on the output lines. Now these output lines are, are also used to program the ROM if it's programmable. And what you do is you address the row you want to program, and then you put the data that's supposed to go into that row on your, on, on your output lines, but they're shifted into an input mode. And, uh, and then you toggle, uh, or you put a small voltage uh, pulse on the program line, and it programs that information into those, the, that row. So, so you, you can often use a ROM to do a design when your time is short and you, and you don't uh, want to spend a lot of time minimizing your output functions, when most of your input combinations are, are needed. Like a great example of that is a keyboard. Uh, almost all keyboards uh, have a ROM that generates the character when you punch the key. And, uh, and the, key, the key is just like it works out to be the address lines. If you hold the shift key down, that's another address line. So you can have lowercase and uppercase characters for all the, all the keys. And then your control, another, another, the control key is another address line. So you can have, you know, shift control or no shift control. Or all the various characters can be control characters. And then maybe there's even a function line. So you can have a function or an alt, an alt line. So you usually have shift control and alt plus some coding for the keyboard to generate all the various key characters that come off the keyboard. And so a big ROM is perfect for that because you need almost all of the combinations. Whereas if you only needed a few things and you could simplify it greatly, then you wouldn't want to implement it with a ROM because you'd, you'd be wasting a lot of, of storage for nothing. You'd, you'd want to have uh, discrete gates in that case or, uh, or a programmable logic type device. Now, we don't really... I don't think we use programmable logic devices much anymore, uh, nor do we really use discrete gates. We're going to implement these uh, usually with CPLDs or FPGAs, or with maybe a microprocessor. Okay, so here's a here's a big read-only memory. This is a this used to be a very standard chip. Uh, I don't know if they still are or not. Uh, they used to be used extensively. Almost every desktop or laptop would have a pair of these in them, uh, so that you could have. Uh, 8K by 16 bits of read-only memory, and in that read-only memory, you would store the boot code to to fire up the disk and to read in the boot tracks off the disk, so you could load up the operating system and get the system started. And this would be the actual only code that was actually available to the processor to execute when it powers up. What's in this? What, what's in these boot ROMs? Um, sometimes the BIOS would be in these as well. And some other things, and anyway, but but uh, and usually we'd have a couple of these 2764s. Maybe this shows you four of them ganged together to give you uh, uh, 16k by 16 bits, and that you can look and see how these are stored. Notice that the the higher order address line A13 uh, is inverted to two of the pairs, so that uh, two of the pairs are. Uh, uh, so the, the bottom pairs go from 0 to 8K, and the upper pairs goes from 8K to 16K. And then the data lines, 16 of the data lines come from here, and 16, or sorry, 8 come from here, and 8 come from there to give you a full 16 bits of data line. So that's how this would work. It, it, and if you needed to boot up a 16-bit processor, then you needed, you needed not an 8-bit ROM, but you needed a 16-bit ROM, but you could gang these together to make your own, uh, you know, 16K by 16-bit word size ROM. All right, and of course, if A13, we know that uh, we we know that we have address lines 0 through 13 or through tw 0 through 12, and then A13. I guess we do have. Oh, I see. Yeah, these are 0 through 12. 
this A13 would be, it's not implemented on the chips because it's implemented here with the chip enable, with the, out, with the chip selects. All right. So whenever we specify a ROM, we're going to specify the number of rows and the number of columns. And then the number of address and the number of rows is always going to be uh, a power of two. And the number of address lines then are going to be the log base two of of the number of rows. And it should be it should be an integer, but if it's not, you'd round it up, obviously. Um, in this case, eight eight outputs. You have to have then uh, you have to have then uh, eight eight output lines, and if you have eight K, then obviously you need uh, you need thirteen bits of address or address lines A zero through A twelve. All right, now programmable logic. I'm I'm going to go over this pretty quickly uh, because this is something that we don't use much anymore, so I don't really want you to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, this used to be real popular, but uh, as technology has moved forward, these have now been sort of superseded by uh, either dedicated chips in most cases, or if you're actually having to, to do this, you would probably get a CPLD chip. A CPLD chip might cost you a buck uh, for a smaller one, uh, maybe two, well, under two dollars, or for a really big one, you might pay, I think I saw one for sixty-eight dollars in a, uh, just the other day I was looking, uh, but that was a pretty big one. And if you go up from that, then you're going to use an FPGA. And again, uh, there are FPGAs that you can probably get for 10 or 15 or 20 bucks for a small one. And you might pay a thousand or more dollars for a really big one. So they can be quite pricey. Uh, but the really big ones are incredibly powerful. So uh, for the applications you'd use them for, uh, it's, probably, it's probably money well spent. And it saves you from having to make your own chip. So. Uh, however, if you're going to produce, you know, a million of these things, then you wouldn't want to use an FPGA. You would want to make your own chip because that, that would be much more cost effective. All right. So, so these stands for programmable logic arrays and programmable array logic. This was a subset of the PLA. And then they, there were all sorts of other names that came out, which you can see here. Uh, these are pretty much gone. I, you don't need to memorize these or even think about them much. Uh, they're just pretty much not used anymore. The way the PLA the P, the P, the PLA is set up, it has it's just set up exactly like uh, a min term expression off of a truth table. Let me get myself over here. So so it has it has a set of input AND gates and uh, each each different function, and you might have some number of functions. Each different function has one output OR gate associated with it which ORs together some number of these input AND gates. Now, on these things, there are usually quite a few inputs. There might be 10 or 15 inputs. And there might be quite a few AND gates here that, that can pull together uh, pull together any, any number of these input, input terms. So you could make uh, all, all sorts of product terms with these gates. Uh, you could make A prime, B prime, C, D, E, F, G if you wanted, uh, or you could just make uh, CG if you wanted, or whatever. And then over here in your output array, uh, they kind of came in two flavors. The one flavor, this output array was also programmable, but in some of them, this output array was a fixed thing so that these OR gates would, would already automatically be connected to maybe three or four of these AND gates. And then, and then you, so you had to make sure you pick the right three or four AND gates for that output. Uh, but in other cases, you could you could connect whatever outputs of the AND gates you wanted to generate these outputs. And so that's programmable. So the input matrix is always programmable, and the output matrix is programmable in the PLAs, but not in the PALs. Again, I don't care if you know that. Uh, so here's one fixed. These are already programmed for these two AND gates. This, is already, this OR gate is already programmed for these two. Even though it looks like a single line, it's really obviously two lines. Just like these inputs, there's a possibility of, of uh, eight different inputs. A or A prime, B or B prime, C or D, C prime, D or D prime. Obviously, you don't want to, you, you wouldn't put in both, well, you might put in both D and D prime if you wanted to make it, a, you know, if you wanted to basically make that input a one. 
anyway, so so you can program this part here. So you want to program these two AND gates to generate the two product terms you want to OR together for this output. And you want to program these two AND gates to generate the two product terms you want to OR together for these gates. Now this is a simple example. You probably wouldn't actually uh, just have two AND gates for one OR gate. You might have four or five or something. Uh, and some of these might even overlap so that so that three of them might so this one might be connected to both so the and this one might be connected to both so so there'd be you know three for the R gate and three for this one uh, and then one of them would be different that kind of thing there were lots of uh, lots of different uh, uh, different ways that these devices were made uh, and then they were programmed with these things called the personality matrix. You'd set up this truth table. You'd find, you'd generate, you'd look at your equations. You'd figure out what terms you needed. You'd generate all those terms, and then you'd put them together in your output matrix to drive those four functions, say. Um, now, here's one where all the possible connections are available. And then once you program it, you wind up with just the ones left over that you really needed. And the unwanted connections are, are blown. Now this is one-time programmable, and many most of these were one-time programmable. Really, no real need to reprogram them. Um, so here's a here's the, the the PLA programmable input matrix, programmable output. Here's the PAL uh, programmable input matrix, but the output matrix is already pre-programmed. Well, this is just shows you unprogrammed program. That's what this shows really. Okay. Now, in, in this day and age, uh, the, all these various companies' proprietary uh, tools and languages for programming these programmable uh, uh, logic arrays are pretty well you know, gone away. Because now we really only use hardware description language like the, Ver like the VHDL and the Verilog you've been exposed to already in this course. And, and so we have universal tools and not just these individual tools. And, uh, and we're pretty much only going to use CPLDs or FPGAs. That's pretty much it. And all these other things have pretty well gone the way of the, the way of the, the trash heap. All right, here's another one. You can see this one's programmed. It generates these outputs. Uh, here's another uh, BCD to gray code converter, uh, kind of showing you the process. Again, we're not going to do this because we're we're you know these these. You know, we'll we use hardware description language if we need to do this. All right. And here's here's a programmed PAL. So this is a PAL that uh, that has one, two, three, four AND gates associated uh, with this output, four with this output, four with this output, and four with this output. So if you so you can only have four product terms for each of your outputs. At least in this part, that's how that was set up. Um, all right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. What I will show you is here's here's some of the here's a list of some of the commercially available PALs of a number of years ago. Probably not relevant today at all. Uh, I don't even I you probably can buy some of these still just because people have uh, devices that are out there, legacy devices that have these legacy parts, and they may need to replace parts or or maybe they need to make a few more legacy devices, and they don't want to. Go back and change everything, and so they so they're they're still using some of these, but th they're not introducing new parts. I mean, basically, if you're going to do a new design, you're going to use a CPLD or an FPGA. You're not going to use one of these. Uh, at least that's my that's my personal opinion. Uh, but you can see these had a number of configurations and uh, quite a few inputs here. This had 20 inputs, but only one output function. And it was set up in an AND, and then you could either have OR gates or NOR gates for the output, which just meant you could, you could get the non-inverted or the, the inverted output. These were mostly AND OR, but they weren't all that way. And then some of these had active low logic. Uh, some of them allowed you to do both high active high or active low logic. And that, that, this also goes back to kind of an older day where, where we often used uh, active low logic. Um, but we don't really do that much anymore uh, because we use hardware description language with a synthesizer to take care of this. We don't even have to think about it. So, um, so 
these parts grew into CPLDs, Complex Programmable Logic Devices, which are basically just a bunch of PLAs or uh, PALs all hooked up. It's a very large scale integrated circuit and uh, it has functional blocks, macro cells, and then these IO blocks that you can program for either inputs or outputs, and then this big interconnect array that you can use to route your signals all over the place to connect things up the way you need to. And here's your interconnect array, uh, 36 lines out here, 16 lines in, uh, 16 lines in, 16 lines in, 16 lines in, 36 out, 36 out. And you can see in here you can program any of these lines to connect to any of these other lines. And then here's your outputs. These are what are connected to the actual pins on the chip that go to the outside world to do stuff. And then you have these functional blocks and these macro cells. And the macro cells are, uh, have flip-flops and, and, uh, and, uh, and a programmable logic in them. And the function blocks uh, do as well. So most of, the, most of the macro cells are identical, if not all of them. You can program the macro cells and their interconnects. Uh, they include flip-flops. Oh, well, this is a field programmable gate array. Okay, so, so, so when you go from the CPLD to the next level, now you go to FPGAs. FPGAs can have hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, uh, of logic cells. So these can be quite large chips. The, most of the cutting edge uh, integrated circuit development it, besides being done on maybe uh, Intel processors and AMD processors and uh, graphics cards, the next very complicated uh, stuff would be FPGAs. And, and a lot of these companies are using 10 nanometer technology now. Um, so it, so they're, they're very much cutting edge, uh, big integrated circuits. Okay. Um, so you should remember, uh, you should remember about multiplexers, decoders, ROMs, and programmable logic. On the programmable logic side, I just want you to remember uh, CPLDs and FPGAs. If you take digital systems design, you'll be working with uh, a project board that has CPLDs on it, and you'll be learning how to program those. Okay. Uh, one more thing, and this is Shanna's expansion. Uh, basically, this is a way to take any four, four, uh, any n value logic expression and to break it into two n minus one value expressions. And it's really pretty straightforward. There's not much to it. Uh, let's look at it. So let's say you have an expression f of a, b, c, d, but you want to decompose it to two three variable expressions, one for where a is considered to be one and one for where a is considered to be zero. So the first one here would be a prime, where a is considered zero, and this then would be the part where a is considered one. So we can just break it down right like this. So let me, let me, let me work this out for you. So I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll, we'll do that, and this will pretty much end on this. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so I think what I'll do, I'll take this first one and show you how to break it down into using a to break it down into two expressions, one where a is a prime and one where a is uh, a. All right, so here we go. And, okay, and let's see. Okay, now let me write that down. I happen to still have it here. So f of a, b, c, d equals, uh, C prime D prime plus A prime B prime C plus B C D plus A C prime. Now, if we're going to decompose on A, you could decompose on any of the variables you want, but we're going to decompose on A. Okay, so 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 if we decompose on, uh, let's first do the A prime. So if we're going to do, so our F is going to equal A prime times what? Well. We know we have to have this one, b prime c, plus, since there's no a prime here, you have to have this term. So that's going to be c prime d prime, plus b c d, b c d. Since this is a, you don't need this term. And then plus a times, well, you need this term, c prime, plus 
and here's C prime D prime. Of course, you could get rid of this because you have a C prime here, but we'll leave it for now. Plus, we don't need the A prime term, but we do need the B, C, D term. All right. So, so you have uh, uh, what did I do? Uh, let's see, a prime, b prime c, plus c prime d prime, plus uh, b c d. Yeah, and then here c prime plus c prime d prime plus b c d. So that's that's all there is to that. Fairly straightforward. Okay, so we'll go back. I will shrink this back. And you can see we got the same thing here. Which allows you to sort of break it down into these two terms, F0 and F1, where this would be F0 and this is F1, multiplied by A prime and A. You could also now factor out another variable. And you then you'd have f as a function of four different terms in a, a and b. All right, let's switch this back. And I'll switch me down here. Somehow it changed my format. All right, and I believe that's it. Okay, so we will we will quit with that. Okay, so um, that pretty much does it, and I'll, I'll, we'll have a little quiz to go with this lecture. And then um, we did look at the syllabus, I think, right? Let's see. Yeah. So we'll, um, at some point, we do have the Queen and McCluskey test coming up. Yeah, and uh, we'll give you a practice. Uh, oh, okay. So the Queen and McCluskey test will be on Friday. Now, uh, I'll still do a lecture for Friday, and this will be pretty straightforward. You can, you can just do it online and upload it. No big deal. All right. Uh, so, but I'll review that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll review. I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll do a review of Quinny McCluskey um, uh, on Friday, although you could just go back and look at the Quinny McCluskey uh, videos as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll do a little review on Friday, uh, and then we'll just continue uh, working through our uh, units. All right, so uh, pretty much with that, we will uh, stop the recording and uh, we will uh, see you again on Friday.